Hi guys, um, my name is Sanjay Gupta. I am a consultant cardiologist in York. And today I wanted to do another video on atrial fibrillation. And this uh, video is entitled Strokes in Atrial Fibrillation, Offspring or Sibling. Uh, it's uh, slightly enigmatically titled and I will explain it to you in a second. The first thing to say is it, the big concern in people's minds when you suffer from atrial fibrillation or when you're diagnosed with atrial fibrillation is that atrial fibrillation increases the risk of stroke fivefold. Okay, so your risk of stroke goes up by five times if you have atrial fibrillation. And traditional thinking has always been that it is the atrial fibrillation that causes the stroke, i.e., when you are in atrial fibrillation, uh, your heart does not beat as effectively as it should. And because it isn't beating as effectively as it should, some blood, which would ordinarily be pumped out of the heart, doesn't get pumped out. And therefore, you get stasis, i.e. stagnation of blood, because blood is not moving. And because of that stagnation, you form a blood clot, and that blood clot can get dislodged and go to the brain and cause a stroke. That is the traditional thinking about atrial fibrillation, that atrial fibrillation is the parent of stroke, i.e. stroke is the offspring of atrial fibrillation. Okay, and That is what everyone used to think. Um, but now our thought process is changing about this, and let me explain this to you. We also know that atrial fibrillation tends to keep bad company, i.e. atrial fibrillation tends to occur in older people. Atrial fibrillation tends to occur in people who have high blood pressure and diabetes and sleep apnea and uh, heart failure. So atrial fibrillation is commonly found in um, <clears throat> amongst bad company. I, you know, there's lots of other things that are often seen in people who suffer from atrial fibrillation, old age, high blood pressure, diabetes, heart failure, etc., etc. So the question is, is it the bad company that the atrial fibrillation uh, is seen with? Is that the parent of stroke, i.e. are atrial fibrillation and strokes both siblings and actually children of the bad company that you see uh, in patients with atrial fibrillation, i.e. the high blood pressure, the obesity, the diabetes, etc., etc. And so to try and make you, try, try and explain what I'm trying to talk about, here we go. Okay, let me tell you about this interesting study that was done a while ago, all right? Um, now, there was a study done by Professor Bernard Gersh, okay, uh, and that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1987. And that paper was entitled The Natural History of Lone Atrial Fibrillation. So basically what they did was they took 300, uh, th sorry, 3,623 patients who were below the age of 60, who had no other a comorbidity other than atrial fibrillation, i.e. the atrial fibrillation was lone. It had no bad company. There was no high blood pressure in these people. There was no diabetes in these people. There was no heart failure in this, in this population. There were young people with atrial fibrillation, lone atrial fibrillation. And these guys followed these patients up for 15 years. Okay, and at the end of 15 years, they wanted to try and work out how many of these patients had had strokes. Okay, now the amazing thing was that the probability of survival at 15 years was 94%. Okay, so they concluded that, the, that these patients had an incredibly low risk of stroke. Okay, so in patients who have no other comorbidities, and who are generally young but have atrial fibrillation, the risk of stroke was extremely, extremely low. All right. Now, they then decided that they would do another study where they looked at patients with atrial fibrillation who had lots of comorbidities, 
who were older, who had diabetes, who had high blood pressure. And they looked at 4,618 patients. And this is a study that was published in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology in 2007, again, by Professor Bernard Gersh. Um, the, the purpose was to assess what happens to patients with atrial fibrillation in a community, you know, and th this is, these are patients who were older, these were patients who had high blood pressure and diabetes. And the amazing thing was they took 4,618 patients and within a mean follow-up of five to 10 years, okay, they found that 3,085 of 4,618 patients had died, suggesting a hugely high risk not only of uh, heart failure, uh, sorry, of death, heart failure, and strokes, all right? So the question then arises that if it is the atrial fibrillation, which is the parent of strokes, why isn't the atrial fibrillation causing strokes in these younger people who don't have any other comorbidities? Uh, why do people who have the comorbidities have such a totally different outcome to people who don't have the comorbidities whilst both groups still have the atrial fibrillation? And this has now led us to start thinking that it is perhaps not the atrial fibrillation that is causing the stroke, it is the comorbidities, the company that the atrial fibrillation keeps that causes the stroke. And maybe atrial fibrillation is just a marker. Maybe atrial fibrillation is something that is telling us that you that this these comorbidities are getting together and perhaps the development of atrial fibrillation just tells you that you've got so many more comorbidities that your risk of having a stroke is higher. Perhaps the atrial fibrillation itself isn't causing the stroke, uh, but the comorbidities are. And that's really important because then it just raises the point that people don't need to be, you know, that unless you treat the comorbidities or prevent comorbidities from happening, um, you may not necessarily alter the risk of stroke, okay? And this is one of the reasons why people say that even if your atrial fibrillation has been treated, if you have the comorbidities, you should remain on anticoagulants long term, regardless of whether you are still in atrial fibrillation or not. Now, here's a very interesting uh, concept. We try and calculate the stroke risk in patients who have atrial fibrillation using a scoring system called the CHADS2 VASC scoring system. Okay, so you take a patient with atrial fibrillation, you then work out what their risk is and their risk is dependent on the comorbidities they carry, which makes sense, is exactly what I've been saying. So you look for high blood pressure, diabetes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the higher the risk, the CHADS2 VASC score, the bigger the risk of stroke in patients with atrial fibrillation. There was an interesting um, um, paper in the Canadian Journal of Cardiology in 2015 where what they did was they took a bunch of patients who had pacemakers, okay? And the usefulness of that is that when you have a pacemaker, you can accurately tell whether the patient is getting any atrial fibrillation or not. Because atrial fibrillation can sometimes be silent, you can't take a general population who say, oh, well, I don't have atrial fibrillation, because how can you be sure they're not having atrial fibrillation? Because it can be silent, they may not pick it up. But if you have a monitoring device in them, then you can be absolutely confident that there is no atrial fibrillation happening. So they took a bunch of patients with, atrial, with, with pacemakers who had no evidence of atrial fibrillation at any point, okay? They then calculated their CHADS2 VASC score, i.e. they looked for high blood pressure, diabetes, the kind of comorbidities, the kind of bad company that you often see with atrial fibrillation, but they were looking for this, these things in patients who had never had atrial fibrillation. And they then used those to try and work out the risk of stroke. And they found that the CHADS2 VASC score predicted the risk of death or stroke in patients regardless of whether they had atrial fibrillation or not. And again, that goes to show that perhaps it's not the atrial fibrillation that is causing the strokes, perhaps it's all the comorbidities that are causing the stroke. And that is why the 
the most important thing you can do, okay, in terms of preventing strokes is modifying lifestyle and acting on those comorbidities aggressively because those are the things that probably cause the stroke, not necessarily the atrial fibrillation. And that therefore gives credence to the fact that um, when, regardless of whether your atrial fibrillation is present or has gone, um, your risk remains as long as your comorbidities remain. And therefore you need to be anticoagulated regardless. All right, so I hope that was helpful. Um, um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Let me just tell you a little bit about myself. So my name is Sanjay Gupta. Um, I'm a cardiologist. I work in York. Uh, I have a website. Um, oops. Yeah, sorry, that doesn't show very well. Uh, my website is actually York Cardiology. Um, uh, www dot your cardiology at gmail oh, sorry www dot your cardiology dot co dot uk my email address is your cardiology at gmail dot com if you want to uh, speak to me if you want to ask me about uh, your AF don't hesitate and drop me a line I can't promise I'll answer straight away but I will eventually get around to answering uh, my work is a little bit um, overwhelming at the present time uh, but I will definitely try all right uh, so I hope you enjoyed this uh, presentation. Um, uh, if you'd like to, please please uh, drop me a comment. Uh, it'd be really useful. And if you want me to do anything else on these subjects, then please do drop me a comment as well. And also, uh, you know, please consider subscribing and sharing because um, I found that some people have really benefited from this. Uh, but also it's good for me because it uh, motivates me and keeps me going. All right. Thank you very much. All right. All the best.